He was threatened. He was threatened. And in what way, specifically? With a firearm. Well, tell us what was said. You know, we'll edit it. Tell us what was said. Uh, kill that mother that mother dead, you dead and he sees that much of a shotgun coming up over the uh, rim of the, of the SUV, which is up higher than his Jetta. And it's all he sees are heavily tinted front windows that are up and the back windows that are down. And the car has at least four black men in it. That is the attorney for shooting suspect, Michael Dunn. Uh, and she is on the phone and we are examining this case uh, he is apparently through his attorney trying to distance himself from the other high profile highly charged case in florida trayvon martin uh, versus george zimmerman uh, by saying that uh, michael dunn is not a vigilante but others point to striking similarities between these uh, two cases both victims african-american both 17 years old when they died both were shot uh, dead by older men of other racial backgrounds. Both alleged killers say they were threatened, even though both teens were unarmed. Uh, at least, uh, certainly, this is what appears to be the case so far in the Dunn case, although you just heard the attorney for Michael Dunn uh, suggesting perhaps that there was a weapon that was discarded. Natalie Jackson, you are the attorney for the Trayvon Martin family. You've been listening to my interview with uh, Michael Dunn's attorney, her first national interview. What's your reaction to her explanation of events? Jane, I have to tell you, I have some questions about her explanation of events. I, one of the questions that I have is, why didn't he just drive away? I, he was in a car, why did he just drive away? The other question that I have is that apparently his girlfriend was inside the store. How did he pick her up? And if he had time to stop his car and get her, why didn't he just call the police? Why didn't he call the police as he was driving away? Why did he wait till the next day? I do not envy this attorney's job because there are a lot of questions that need to be answered and I feel sorry for this family. They have my condolences. This should never have happened. Well, uh, I want to go back to Robin Lemonitis to get her response. But first, I want to go to Mike Brooks, HLN law enforcement analyst. Your thoughts on what you're hearing this evening as the attorney for Michael Dunn explains her version of events. Well, first of all, Jane, I've got a real problem as a former investigator and, and a current gun owner who carried a gun on a job for 26 years. Now, he goes shooting with military and law enforcement, yet he doesn't trust law enforcement if he fired his gun uh, in self-defense. And then he leaves. Why not leave and call 911? I guess because of the trust issue. Secondly, uh, what does the video there at the gas station show what happened? You know, I just can't get past the fact, Jane, that he left and did not call police. If he was a responsible gun owner, you know that if you do fire your weapon, that you're going to have to call law enforcement. Just like if he was stopped while he had a gun in his car, he is under the obligation to tell law enforcement, hey, I'm a gun owner, I have a permit, I have a gun in the car, whether it be on himself or in the glove compartment. Um, and he must have really injured his ears after cranking off nine rounds at a high, very high decibel range, probably higher than what the music was. But I'm not buying this trust issue with law enforcement. I'm just not buying that. If he has friends in law enforcement, all he's right. been through all this training. Oh, we have to take a hard break for a couple of seconds. We're going to be back with more uh, from all sides. Stay right there. They said Jordan's dead. And I just... I just lost it. That is the mother of 17-year-old Jordan Davis, who was shot dead this past Friday. And uh, our understanding is he was a high school student who had uh, just said prayers over Thanksgiving dinner the night before, uh, thanking uh, a new job that he had gotten working at McDonald's. He was in a car with uh, three other friends. They had stopped at a gas station, and there was a confrontation with uh, Michael Dunn, a 45-year-old software designer, um, who was at that gas station as his girlfriend went in to get some wine and come out and uh, there were words exchanged. You've heard the words from his attorney that he says were exchanged um, and he fired, according to police, eight or nine shots and uh, Jordan Davis died.
And now we're talking to his attorney. We're also talking to the attorney for uh, someone involved in a similar case, uh, Trayvon Martin's family attorney. But I want to go to my dear friend and television personality, Rolanda Watts. Uh, we covered the Trayvon Martin case together and continue to cover that. You've been listening to all sides. What do you make of this? Oh, it's just so, it's devastating. And I know that uh, the young man's mom does not want us to, to talk about the divisiveness that this case may represent, but it is eerily similar to Trayvon Martin, another 17-year-old kid, African-American boy, shot uh, by what seems to be a vigilante. It is making people I know on my Facebook page, Jane, especially mothers, very concerned, not just black mothers, but mothers of any kid who plays loud music. And there are so many questions, as you have brought out, so many questions. It's hard for me to believe that this guy was that skittish when he's carrying a gun around in his, in his uh, glove compartment. It, it really makes me so shattered emotionally when I think about the lack of civility, the lack of humanity that goes with somebody who fires off a gun, unloads eight, nine, maybe nine bullets, and doesn't even... I mean, it would, what about the quality of life? I guess they don't care about that when you blow off a eight to nine bullets, but that doesn't sound like somebody who's skittish. If somebody who's skittish of the cops, then, you know, I think there's certain mores that go with somebody who claims to be a aficionado of guns and who carries guns. You should have called the cops. He never turned himself in, based upon the reports that I'm seeing. He had to be arrested after he drove three hours away, a day after he fired off eight, possibly nine rounds. Um, it, it, it really, I don't want to keep pushing the race issue. I don't want to do that. But we've got a real problem, folks, if kids can't stop at a gas station with loud music playing. It was none of his business. Pump your gas, get your wine, go home. And I do wonder, maybe he left and didn't call the cops because maybe he was under the influence of alcohol from his son's wedding. Maybe he did do some drugs. I don't know. But they, it does raise a question why you blow off nine, possibly nine bullets, and don't even stop. Don't turn yourself in. Don't make not one phone call. I'm sorry, but that doesn't sound like a skittish person to me. Uh, it sounds like what the police are calling it, an alleged murder. Uh, we, we have to take a break again. On the other side, we hope that the attorney for Michael Dunn stays there so that we can... Uh, continue to get all sides in this controversy as it unfolds and you're hearing some of the stuff uh, we'd like to get Robin's response to some of the things that uh, you just heard from Rolanda uh, she said that he was not under the influence uh, but what about some of the other comments stay right there he was threatened he was threatened and in, in what way specifically with a firearm well tell us what was said you know we'll edit it tell us what was said uh, kill that mother that mother dead, you dead and he sees that much of a shotgun coming up over the uh, rim of the, of the SUV, which is up higher than his Jetta, and it's all he sees are heavily tinted front windows that are up and the back windows that are down, and the car has at least four black men in it. That is the attorney for this man you're looking at here, Michael Dunn, a 45-year-old software designer who is now accused of murder and attempted murder uh, for allegedly shooting eight, maybe nine, a spray of gunfire into the car uh, that had four young African-American teenagers in it. And one of them, Jordan Davis, died. And tonight we are talking with in the first national interview she's given Robin Lemonitis, the attorney for the suspect in this case, Michael Dunn. Uh, we just heard your interview, Robin, and thank you for staying with us. And you refer to the racial identity of the men in the car. You heard uh, Rolanda Watts, television personality, say a moment ago that uh, that race is an issue in this case. Uh, what would you say to that? I will. I say that it is not the issue. The issue was that that Michael Dunn was threatened with a firearm, and he is very familiar with firearms and knows one when he sees one. It would not have mattered if the people in the car were black, white, Asian, Hispanic, abled, disabled, old, young, etc. It only matters that 
he was threatened at, to the extent that he felt his life was in danger and that violence was imminent. Okay, uh, um, Joey Jackson. Let me add. Okay, can I just ask you to pause for one second? Joey Jackson, criminal defense attorney. Uh, if there were words that were said, first of all, we don't know if anybody could ever prove that. It, even if there's surveillance video, it wouldn't necessarily have audio. But if, hypothetically, there were words said that were threatening words, is that enough to um, successfully use the stand your ground law in Florida that allows you to shoot somebody if you are presumably in fear of your life? Uh, Jane, no, it's not. There's a lot of questions here. The first thing that the defense has to overcome is, number one, was he the initiator? In the event you don't like loud music or you have an ear problem, you roll up your window. Number two, was the force that he used proportionate to the threat posed? He shot eight times, which leads to question number three. Was that reasonable under the circumstances? Were his actions reasonable and appropriate? Number four, when you evaluate this, Jane, you ask yourself, was he intoxicated? We we may never know why, because he left the scene of an accident. So that's number five. Why leave? It demonstrates consciousness of guilt. He also was at a wedding. I know when my son gets married, a lot of years to go for that. I hope he does. I'm not going to be too sober, Jane. I'll admit that. It's a happy occasion. And so what was his state of mind? I think there's a lot that has to be explained by the defense here, Jane, before that stand your ground law could be used or even self-defense could be used. Natalie Jackson, Trayvon Martin family attorney, your thoughts as we hear all sides. My thoughts are that, um, as the attorney said, this is not a black issue. I would caution her for throwing out the words black men in a car. If she doesn't want to make this a racial issue, don't make it one because we don't have to go there because what happened here was egregious enough for him to go to jail and to be, spend a lot of time in prison. Well, uh, we have to leave it right there, but we are all over the story. Obviously, it's just getting started. We want to thank everybody, Natalie and Robin Lemonitis, for joining us, and I hope you all come back again as this story unfolds. Um, and... Uh, Rolanda Watts, my dear friend and television personality, it's always great to see you. Um, on the other side, we're talking about something much happier, the lottery. It's more than a half a billion dollars now. Stay right there.